Dear Chairman, thank you for this invitation and the possibility to illustrate our approach for protecting the brain during cardiac surgery to avoid neurological disorder. I have no disclosures. For me and all of our surgeons, is this, is this the region between the sinotubular junction and the brachiocephalic outflows, a kind of cape of fear, sometimes, because we have to do a lot of procedure in this area, like the cannulation, cross clamping, the aortic valve surgery, and the aortic root surgery. But this is not the whole story of through. There are a lot of other factors that influence the postoperative outcomes of our patients. So on the one hand, we have the anesthetic burden, and the other, of course, we have our field of affection, which is split in surgery itself, material of the used systems for extracorporeal circulation perfusion, and the handling of all these tubes, including the venous and arterial lines. But not only the maneuver of manipulation is affecting, also, also the timing is important. Here you can see a count of irregular signals of a transcranial duplex system during coronary bypass grafting. During side clamping of the aorta, which is an invasive procedure, the count is less than in steady state, that could be a hind, that we do know always what kind of move affords a special kind of consequence concerning the embolism. What we can review in the literature is that in many big trials like this one of New England Journal of Medicine, the preoperative risk factors, patients' burden, are most cited reason neurological injury after cardiac surgery. The system of the heart-lung machine with blood contact to the ear in a reservoir or a venting effects on the venous cannula can cause small bubbles which are able to pass oxygenator and air trap. These microbubbles are possibly avoiding microcirculation of the brain. Last year, we have published a study to evaluate postoperative delirium after coronary bypass grafting. All areas that you can see here, red put under our, our patients with postoperative delirium. And they differed from the non-delirium patients in size of the registered bubbles. The machine, um, the bubble counter, um, added all bubbles during perfusion time to a total capacity of registered bubble volume. The higher the volume under the line, the higher the incidence for delirium. To av avoid microembolism, we can optimize the setup of the extracorporeal circulation. Short tubes to reduce priming volume, to minimize hemodilation, insufflation of CO2 in the situs, to displace air and reduce air embolism, the air trap, who's placed below the ascending part of the arterial tube to utilize the hydrostatic pressure inside the tube. Oxy itself also has a filter function. But not only gas is a potential risk for embolism, also the patient's fat cells are causing microembolism into the brain. So if the fat cells are, are filtered out either by the use of cell salvage or in separate the reservoir with a filter, we count of fat bubbles decreased dramatically. What we all do and what we all fear is that the patient will not awake after this situation. We see here the cross clamping on the aorta in vitro. One possibility is here a cannula with integrated filter to combine perfusion with filtration of a mesh. This cannula is not a standard cannula for us. But the side clamping for central anastomosis is also a risk factor for embolism. The hard string system, like showing here in this movie, is an additional technique to perform anastomosis without manip manipulation.
you can easily perform the anastomosis without the bleeder. And after that, just put away the device. Okay. So this is a real cape of fear. You see uh, aorta of cadaver who is sclerolized. No one of us would like to put a cannula inside of this aorta. To avoid this, the cannulation of the subclavian artery spares out the aorta. Subclavian artery is perfuse retrograde and perfusion of the body works fine. Sorry. There are several tricks and hinds to reach good perfusion of the brain and the body. As you can see here, is the too deep inserted cannula develops a negative pressure inside of a vertebral artery. Okay. Here, the negative pressure, if we put the cannula too deep, um, and we can cause a cerebral hypoperfusion. In technique of direct cannulation of subclavian artery, the vertebral artery should be respected and its lumen should not be misplaced because of the shown steel phenomenon. And we have uh, another techniques to avoid these problems. The physiologic flow profile is an angled helix motion of the blood and this seems to optimize pulsatility function to perfuse brachiocephalic branch and capillary bed with a good transfer of kinetic energy. So what we try is uh, the pulsatile perfusion on the CVG to imitate these with a higher transfer of shear stress to capillary walls, which should upgrade perfusion and oxygenation of the tissue. But also in case of central cannulation, the right position of the cannula is essential for an optimized brain perfusion. If the brachiocephalic trunk is not attached, no malperfusion is seen. In case of too close cannulation with an, a cannula with central flow lumen, there is a negative pressure created inside of the trunk and a steel with flow reversal is the problem. Here also a central lumen cannula with a perfusion that appears out complete the brain supplying arteries, which is not desired. A solution for the cold, for these uh, cold beer cannulation with a diffuser device, because blood flow is not central with a negative pressure beside, beside and behind the mainstream, and this kind of spray can create a good blood output with positive perfusion pressure in an angle of 19 degrees. Additional embed positioning to aortic wall jet lesion are avoided because of reduced pressure of the central perfusion stream. Here in vitro demonstration with and without diffusion, diffusion of the cannula. A typical approach for a surgeon is at the time of the declamping. The cross clamp, the movement of patient's head in a lower position and then to ask the anesthesiologist to compress both carotid arteries from outside. In addition, I would like to show last results of the syntax trial these years, which always shows us the outcome of cardiopulmonary bypass patients from point of view of death caused by stroke or myocardial infraction is still superior to PCI approach in patients with an indication for surgery, including a similar stroke rate overall. Case of valve replacement in patients with severe, severe calcification of the whole aorta is always a risky situation for patient and surgeon. The TAVI approach is here a good alternative for surgical procedure and the avoidance of cardiopulmonary bypass additional without cannulation has its positive effect. 
We think that the post-perioperative assessment of more vital parameters are the outlook for the future. EEG and sensoric and motoric electro electric evoked potential, like we perform in aortic surgery, could help us to evaluate neurological status in real time and not retrospective in CCT scans. Transcardial cardial duplex support to control brain's perfusion. We guess literature is right. The risk factors of the patient for embolization and neurologic injury are limiting. That means calculation of risk factors to confirm adequate, uh, adequate indication. Maybe I would like to point out the, that an anemia with a higher hemodilation is also a risk factor for capillary malperfusion and should be equalized by pre-coating to reduce priming volumen. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>